Welcome to Lost Without Japan, a travel podcast about the life-changing experiences of exploring Japan and those moments we would be lost without. For your listening pleasure, allow me to introduce your very own Kanko Gaido, Michael. Welcome to a special Lost Without Moment bonus interview episode of the Lost Without Japan podcast. Our bi-weekly podcast is focused on getting you to Japan on your first visit or to make your next adventure to Japan even better than your last. Today's special interview episode is with Susan Spann, a Japan-based author, cancer survivor, and climber of more than 100 mountains in Japan. This is the director of travel for TKIC Studio Productions coming to you with positive thoughts and excitement for your next journey to Japan and his own return in the summer of 2023. I'd like to thank you all for giving me a bit of your time today, and I truly hope this podcast finds you in a good place or on the path to a better one, no matter how it may seem at this moment. My belief is we could all use a beacon like this in our lives to help guide us during these times, and my hope is that Japan, along with this show, will become that for you. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. If you're a returning Lost Without listener, thank you again for sharing your time and returning once more. For today's show, let me introduce a special guest and author of the novel Climb the Hiro Hitori novels, and the website susanspan.com. Susan, I must say, I am truly thankful for being introduced to you uh, on a uh, random day uh, with my daughter in Indianapolis at Gen Con, um, with you uh, by a fellow author, Laura Van Arendonk Ba, and for setting you know the time aside to talk with me today and join us for this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And yes, Laura is a great person, a great friend to have. You can tell there's there's certain people in your life, you know, it's uh, that that always are, you know, uh, thinking about not only themselves, but others as well. And uh, she's definitely one of those like good people to have around. So uh, I feel fortunate. So thank you so much, uh, Susan, for joining myself and listeners of Lost Without Japan. And I truly feel that your life and the stories you've written are a fit to anyone whose interest lies within Japan or outside it as well. And really, your knowledge about exploring, hiking, climbing uh, could really transform your next trip to Japan and make it something that's way more than you find in a lot of travel guides uh, that you'll be looking for online. So welcome, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, having me. And I can't wait to talk about uh, climbing and, and mountains and culture and all the wonderful things Japan has to offer. It has a lot, doesn't it? It really does. <laughs> um, it has it all. It really does. Before we get going on today's episode, where can listeners go to take advantage of finding your novels or just looking to answer any additional questions they may have after listening to today's interview? Um, well, let's see. My books are available pretty much anywhere books are sold. So if you buy them through your local bookstore, I always love to give a big prompt to local bookstores and also to libraries. And a lot of people don't know this, but if you're interested in a book and your library doesn't have it, you can actually request it. And libraries have a budget to buy books that are requested. So, you know, whether you like nonfiction and Climb is my uh, nonfiction title, or you like mysteries and the Hirohatori mysteries with Ninja Detective Hiro Hattori and Jesuit Father Mateo, um, you can ask at your local library. You can ask your books, local bookstore to order them. You can find out more about me at my website, which is susanspan.com. That's just one word, span with two ends like a bridge. I also there am posting a photo companion to climb because a lot of people who read climb about my adventures in Japan think to themselves, oh, I wish there were more pictures. And there are. You can find them online. There's a tab on the website. It says climb photo companion. It's about 60 percent complete. And I am working on getting it done because I took 10,000 pictures during my climbing year and I'm having to go through them all to put the photo. And they're not all on the photo companion. (laughs) <laughs> I'm also on Facebook as Susan Span Author, and uh, you can find me on Instagram once again, Susan Span Author. Facebook is sorry, Susan Span Books, 
And then I am on Twitter, although I'm not as active on Twitter as I used to be. So most of the time, if you want to find me, come to Facebook or come to Instagram. I post a lot on Instagram there as well, because I am an avid photographer as well as a writer. That's excellent. And I, I would say with that we mirror each other perfectly with uh, my Instagram being way more active than uh, uh, my Twitter one. It's there, but <laughs> um, I, I'd love to start things off just uh, before we start getting into uh, Japan itself and just let you have a you know bit of time to introduce yourself and share whatever you'd like to share. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I grew up in Southern California and I went to college at Tufts on the East Coast where I majored in Japanese language, history, and culture. And I fell in love with Japan actually in kindergarten, believe it or not, because our kindergarten in Santa Monica, California had a exchange student who was a little girl from Japan named Yoko. And I was a little bit of a loner and Yoko, of course, didn't speak much English. And she was a little bit of a loner. And of course, we attracted to each other and became very, very fast friends. Her father was doing a residency in California, so they, her family was there for a year. And by the end of the year, we were just best friends, and she went back to Japan. And believe it or not, I never saw her again, never heard from her again. And someone once said to me, you should try to find her. And I said, a Japanese woman of 50 named Yoko. I'm sure that won't be difficult at all. <laughs> yeah. So... If there happens to be a Yoko out there listening who was at Franklin Elementary School in the 1970s, feel free to look me up. I would love to see you again. But all I have of that relationship today is a handmade Christmas ornament that her mother made for each of the members of the class, which I still have to this day. Wonderful memories, a college degree, and a life in Japan. So I suppose I owe an awful lot to Yoko, but I've loved Japan ever since. I started writing the Hiro Hattori novels back in about 2012. I'd always wanted to be a novelist. I, had a, I woke up one morning and was getting ready for work. I was a lawyer in my former life and was putting on eyeshadow. And a voice in my head said, most ninjas commit murders, but Hiro Hattori solves them. And I went, wow, I need to find that book. And then I found out that book didn't exist. So I wrote it and seven others that followed. And that is the series involving ninja detective Hiro Hattori and Jesuit Father Matteo, which is set in 1565, so Japan's medieval era. I love it. That's a wonderful story. One of my favorite things about interviewing anyone, uh, you know, in or without that have that love of Japan is where it comes from. And I said, that that is a, a unique and wonderful one, too. And I said, <laughs> I, I hope, I hope. One of these interviews you do, if it's not this one, I hope it, it you know, you end up being able to find each other. And I, I love, too, like that past life, uh, you know, job and things that you were having and then taking that jump uh, to get to Japan. And we can talk about that more, you know, as well. Um, yes. What, like, what are your biggest Japan interests? I mean, I, I can say hiking is definitely going to be one of them. <laughs> uh, but what other things do you have that you uh, enjoy about Japan? I love, as you said, the mountains are, are really a first love of mine. I adore the mountains. When I was climbing the 100 mountains in a year for climb, I made a commitment to myself that I would go to the mountains at, every year to watch the seasons change. So not only to hike during the year, but to watch the transitions. I love Japan's seasons. I love the seasonality of the culture. The idea that, you know, you can go into the convenience store, the konbini, and you can find the most amazing snack on the planet. And two months later, that snack will be gone because it was seasonal. And everyone here just sort of accepts that things come and things go and the cyclical nature of life. You know, I eat strawberries now only in December and January because that's when they're in season in Japan. And Japanese, my yaoya, my, my greengrocer, only carries the vegetables that are in season and the fruits that are in season. And at first it was really difficult because I came from California and we get everything all year round. And what do you mean I can't have a strawberry in March? But now I've really just sort of embraced it. And I love that seasonality. I love the fact that Japan is never the same. You can come back here a million times and it will never be the same. Yes. And living here... I love that idea. It's, it's the whole wabi-sabi aesthetic, the idea that things change, things are always in a state of change. And so we celebrate every moment because it's the only moment, ichigo ichie, one moment, one opportunity. 
and we have to seize that opportunity because this time will never come again. We may have another time similar to it if we're lucky, but it won't be the same. And so that's that's really something that I just, I love that about Japan. I love the lifestyle. I love the food. I love the culture. I love visiting historical sites. I adore shrines and temples. My new house that I just bought is directly across the street from Hiei Jinja. And so I get to see the, sh the temple or the shrine every morning. And I just, I just love it here. All of it. That, that's amazing though. And, and it, it is, uh, I have to agree with you because, you know, you can find something and never have it again. So if you stumble across something you like, you really have to, <laughs> you, you have to stockpile it. You really have to do. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, so we, we, I know you met, um, you know, kindergarten first interaction. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things later on that continued to attract you to Japan? Because I know you had a friend and you had like, you know, this ornament, but you know, like what were some of the things that occurred that made you like decide, you know, Hey, I want to actually move, uh, to Japan and, uh, you know, have this be where I call home or potentially call where you call, you know, call home. Well, I ended up when I was started writing my novels, of course, I would come over every year for research and I would be here for as long as I could get away with it, with having a family and a job in the States, which usually ran between two and four weeks. Yes. And the trips were getting longer and longer. And I found that I was homesick for not for California when I was here, but for Japan. I mean, the minute I would get back, I would start looking at my photos from the trip, which I took copious photos because the best way to do research for me is to go to the places and take the pictures and walk the streets. And I would go home and I would be going through my pictures and I would find myself unable to delete even the terrible picture of the blurred cobblestones when I almost dropped my iPhone and accidentally hit the shutter because I didn't know if I'd be able to be back there again. And I wanted to be back there so badly. It just, it hurt my heart to even delete a photo. And so after doing that for about three or four years, I realized, you know, you'd be better off. You'd be happier if you were living in Japan and just visiting the States. And so I started getting this idea that I would take a sabbatical come to Japan for a year, climb the Hyakumezan, which are the hundred famous mountains of Japan, based on a book by Kuyuya Fukada. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make the jump. I'm going to, but it was just supposed to be a sabbatical. Although I think in my heart, I always knew I, I wanted it to be more, but I thought that was the most I could do. And I was getting ready to apply for the visa to come over here to write the book. Incidentally, I was at that point in my life terrified of everything and had never climbed a mountain in my life, but I was going to do a hundred in a year in order to break free from the fear that had controlled me. I mean, I was afraid of everything. And I just thought, well, uh, you're terrified of this. Let's go do it. You know, let's go climb, climb up. I have no idea what inspired me to do this. I can only say maybe divine inspiration, but, and as preparation for applying for the visa and getting ready to go, I thought, well, I'll be in Japan when I'm supposed to have my mammogram. And I went and had my mammogram early. And uh, the doctor said, well, not quite so fast. We found something. And it turned out that it was, in fact, breast cancer. And so I ended up delaying my departure for Japan by eight months so that I could have a double mastectomy and chemotherapy and then headed over to Japan. I actually moved here on May 14th of 2017. And that was within 30 days of finishing chemotherapy for cancer treatment. And I was on my first mountain at the beginning of June. So how many more things can you tack on, <laughs> you know, that you're, that you're carrying with you as you're doing this hike? Um, you know, that's... I always tell people, not to interject, but I always tell people, be very careful what you wish for when you say you want to face your fears, because my greatest, most existential fear in the entire world was getting breast cancer, as I talk about in the book. And so I said, I'm going to face my fears. And boy, did I get them in spades. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> what are some of your favorite foods or places that you'd love to visit for, you know, meals or snacks while you're in Japan? I am going to give a couple of plugs that you might expect and a couple of plugs that you might not. Um, I adore, when I tell people is when you come to Japan, whatever season it is, eat seasonally. Because the seasonal things are going to be the best. And by that, I don't just mean, well, obviously it's autumn, so I'm going to eat what they're serving. Yes, but there are specific seasonal foods in Japan that everyone loves. So we're in autumn now as we're recording this. 
And the autumn flavors are yakimo or roasted sweet potato and chestnut curry. And I absolutely love them both. This is my favorite time of year, some of my favorite foods. In the winter, that would mean trying strawberries, which are often a summer food in the States, but they're a winter food in Japan because that's when they ripen here. And in the summer, definitely kakigori, shaved, Japanese style shaved ice. And when you come, stretch yourself culinarily. You know, azuki bean is a very popular flavor here in Japan. They make it into a paste called an, and it's sweet. And it's used in treats. And a lot of people go, oh, it's a bean paste. But it's actually very tasty. And you should at least try it. The non-expected recommendation is 808 Manzmar Pizzeria in Hakone, near Hakone Yumoto Station, which is amazing. The owner has a stone pizza oven from Italy. And also Solo Nui Pizzeria at Toritsu Daigaku Station in Meguro. Both of those are some of the best pizzas. They are the best pizzas I have eaten in my life. I have traveled and eaten pizza all over the world. 808 Monsmar in Hakone. A lot of people go to Hakone. If you leave Hakone Yumoto Station, it's a block up on the left in a little alley. It's fantastic. Well, I'm going to have to get the name of that for you, uh, like from you uh, by email or, you know, message after because Funny enough, our next city we're going to be going to talk about next is actually uh, Hakone, and then that you know s uh, trip all around and things uh, that we're going. So perfect yes. timing for that. Perfect timing. <laughs> so oh, Hakone no. is one of my favorite places in Japan. Actually, I have been so many times that I have lost count. I have been so many times that it's embarrassing to me, and I I actually don't tell the truth when Japanese people ask me how many times I've been there because it's embarrassing. But I absolutely adore it. In, with Hakone being uh, uh, one of your go-to locations, um, do you have any others that you have that you'd love to visit in Japan? There are so many, actually. For people who are thinking about coming to Japan, if you're going to be up in Hokkaido, we'll start in the north and we'll come south. If you're going to be in Hokkaido, I strongly recommend that you go to Daisetsuzan National Park. That can be very difficult to reach by public transportation. So I strongly recommend that you contact Hokkaido Nature Tours, owned by a man named Ido Gabe. Ido is fantastic. I have hiked with Ido on a number of occasions. In fact, if you read Climb, Ido's name appears in the book, and I talk about my experience with them. He does custom tours, very affordable, anything from one day up to weeks at a time. And they will take you in private transportation. They will tailor to your desires. So if you're the kind of hiker who thinks that just sort of like driving by the mountain is a good enough hike for you, he can do that. And if you're the kind of hiker who actually wants to get up and look in the mouth of a live volcano, that would be my style. He can do that too. So if you don't know how to approach Hokkaido because it's a difficult place to kind of conceptualize for a lot of Americans, contact Ido. He will absolutely take care of that. And he's good with food tours as well. So Daisetsuzan in the north, absolutely love it. If you're going to be in Tohoku, which is on Japan's main island of Honshu, which is where Tokyo and Kyoto are, but it's up north of Tokyo. I love Sendai. It's a wonderful city. It has a great castle mountain. It's got a lot of um, historical sites. I recommend going to Date Masamune's tomb, which is a wonderful, wonderful example of old architecture. Tokyo. Wow. Well, we'll talk about Tokyo later. I'm just going to put a pin in Tokyo and say it's all awesome. Curiously, when I first started coming to Japan, my preference was for Kyoto because I am a historian. Kyoto, Tokyo is more of a modern city. Kyoto is more of a historical city in terms of the way people conceptualize them. But there's so much history in Tokyo, and it's so wonderful. So there's that. Obviously, you can't really get away without going to Kyoto. I love Hakone. The Hakone circuit is amazing. You ride a train, and then a cable car, and then a gondola, and then a ship. All kinds of scenery and a live volcano, and it's the best bang for your buck for a one-day day trip or overnight out of Tokyo that there is. Oshima Island in Izu to the south is wonderful. I mean, I could do this all day, right? Uh, so <laughs> I, I absolutely. And then last thing I'll say, although I could go all the way, literally could go all the way. My recommendation is, you know, if you read Climb, any of the places I went, they're all great. But you mentioned at one point when you and I were chatting that you like Hiro that you have friends in Hiroshima. You've probably been to Miyajima, the island off the coast of Hiroshima. But 
a night That's... overnight on on Miyajima is absolutely one of my favorite things to do. Outstanding. And I said, if you ever make your way uh, back, uh, Good Time Funari is going to be my recommendation for a place to stop and stay. Uh, that was my my uh, fall in love with the area is just all of the people in general. And, and it happens as you go throughout Japan in general, I said. But um, having a hot dog and a beer um, <laughs> halfway around the world um, <laughs> is always just uh, something that makes me uh, smile every time I go. So it's good. you know. <laughs> And Japan loves hot dogs and beer, so you're good there. With your uh, your hiking and things, what other hobbies do you have um, as you're traveling around uh, Japan? I love photography. I absolutely adore photography. In fact, my Facebook uh, stream, as well as my Instagram stream, I try and post every single day photographs from Japan, from different places. I try to give a little bit of cultural explanation or history for some of the things that need context. And so I just love sharing that on Facebook and on Instagram. I adore trying new foods. I have the unique uh, attribute of being allergic to fish, which is always fun in Japan. There, However, a lot of Japanese cuisine does not involve fish. People are surprised by that, but it does not. So I love eating shojin ryori, which is Buddhist temple cuisine. I love staying in Buddhist temples. A lot of the temples you can stay in, they're called shukubo or temple lodgings. I am myself not a Buddhist. It doesn't matter that you can stay in a temple if you are a Buddhist. You can stay in a temple if you're not a Buddhist. I love onsen, visiting different onsen, which are the volcanic hot spring baths, which I absolutely adore. And one thing I will mention to people in light of that, a lot of people are really nervous about the onsen in Japan because you go in nude and there are other people there. And that's very intimidating. And in fact, my first four trips to Japan, no, my first three trips to Japan, I did not go in the onsen because I was a little overweight and I was not comfortable with my body. And I was afraid that people would stare at me and I didn't want to get naked. And... I can tell you as a breast cancer survivor and someone who has no breasts, just, you know, I didn't have reconstruction because that was not something that I was interested in for various reasons we can, you know, don't need to go yeah. into, but I can promise you if they don't stare at me, they won't stare at you and nobody looks, you know, some people say, how do you know nobody looks? I, I guarantee you nobody looks. It, it, that may be TMI. No, but, but anyway, but, but it's, it's one of those things like you re quickly realize when you're doing it that they really don't care. Like the person no. with the insecurity about it is really it's it's you. And if you can let that go, you're going to enjoy your time, you know, so much more um, when you realize it's like they really it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. at Nobody's all. Nobody's looking. No. It's only about you. And the onsen is so wonderful. So relaxing. I've had a lot of friends come to Japan and say, I'm not sure I want to do it. And everyone I say the same thing. I'm not going to put any pressure on you. I don't want to make you uncomfortable. Don't do it if you don't want to. But if you have any curiosity, at least give it a chance. And there is a 100% ratio of friends who have tried it to friends who absolutely love it. So I just tell people, you know, really, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And don't do anything that makes you uncomfortable. But if you have any curiosity, give it a shot. And it, I also play, like to point out, too, if you uh, want the icebreaker before that is rent. Uh, and I, like you stay at a location that has those, uh, you know, private uh, baths, like within your room or on a balcony, you know, take it all in, enjoy. And once you realize how amazing it is, um, you'll want to do them way more often and you won't care if someone else is with you or not. So, you know, it really is. It's great. That's actually how I got over my fear is that the, fir the third, the second time I was there, I rented a place, I, I not rented, I stayed in a real con that had a private in-room onsen. And once I had, you know, experienced it just privately, I thought, wow, that's so amazing. I'm just going to give it a shot and yep, haven't ever looked back. It's one of those things that, uh, you know, one of the things I look forward to most when moving to Japan is just having a nice bath. That's like, you know, <laughs> it's like, it is one of the things I miss the most. And I, I want to kind of uh, transition us a bit. And I think this question might be a nice one before we move into your novel um, is what advice could you give to someone who's thinking about transitioning to writing as a career, or maybe they're just looking to start their first career and have that be writing themselves? Oh, wow. That is a, that is a long question to answer. So let me think about a short answer to that one. I think I would give them three pieces of advice. 
The first one is, if it's your dream and in your heart, do it. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you have experience or no experience. If this is what you want, and this doesn't just apply to writing, by the way, this applies to any dream that somebody's got in their heart. You know, the tagline for climb is dare to dream because you can, in fact, make those dreams come true, but you have to dare to take the step. So I would say do it. 100% do it. That's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is learn the craft. You have to be able to put sentences together. You have to know English grammar. You, can you break the rules? Yes, but you have to know the rules thoroughly before you're allowed to break them. So understand that that first book, that first novel may or may not actually end up being published. Mm -hmm. I wrote five novels, five full length novels, 250,000, over 250,000 words before I found my agent and got published. And self-publishing is an option. But think very carefully because it is a very, 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 very rare bird whose first book really should be published. So just have the patience to do it right. If you're going to do it, do it well. The third piece of advice is don't give up your day job expecting that your first novel is going to pay your bills because it won't. <laughs> so absolutely do it. It doesn't matter if anyone reads it, do it anyway and continue to do it. And if you don't do it well the first time, keep learning, keep growing. You will get there. I used to tell people when I was a lawyer, because I was a publishing lawyer, and I would speak at conferences. And the thing that I would tell people is this. Publishing is a game of last man standing. And you are the one who decides when you sit down. So be stubborn, have courage, and stay standing, and you will make it eventually. Could not agree more. I love it. I must say that I've truly enjoyed reading your book, Climb, and I can say that I felt some of your struggles are ones that I share myself and I continue to work on as well. And reading about those struggles, accomplishments, and then the history of the areas that you visited really provided a lot of places that I didn't know about or may not have thought to explore myself. And I really feel that Beyond the inspiration that you can take from Climb itself, you can really find some places that you went to yourself and it's like firsthand, like talking to a best friend and, and getting their recommendation of like, hey, I was in this area, here's some things I enjoyed and taking and making those your own. Um, I absolutely loved uh, just reading everything that came along with that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And then um, I wanted to just kind of share a little bit because that idea of climbing a hundred mountains or a hundred peaks and having that be something that, you know, those in Japan or outside of that are looking to do this kind of do over a lifetime and then have that be over the case course of a year. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because I'm going to can, you know, say like most people that are listening probably don't know, um, about that. So I'd, I'd love for you to share just a little bit about that before we get too much further in. Sure. Well, the Hyakumeizan or the hundred famous mountains of Japan, as I mentioned, are based on a book that was written by a Japanese mountaineer. And he had climbed hundreds and hundreds of mountains in Japan and came to the realization, for him at least, that if you climbed these particular hundred, you would gain an understanding of what mountains in Japan were all about, what it meant to be a mountain in Japan. And curiously, in his later life, when he was interviewed again, he said, well, I never really thought it was going to take off and become quite this big a thing. I might have put a few different mountains in or changed the list up a little bit if I really thought it was going to be a thing. And it has become a thing. And so people go to climb these mountains. They're located all over Japan. Some are on islands. Some are, well, all of Japan technically is an island. I should clarify, Japan has four primary islands from north to south. They are Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu. But there are a lot of sub-islands, smaller islands off the coast of Japan in various places. And so these Yakumezan are located all over. Most Japanese people climb them over the course of a lifetime because it is a learning experience. You grow as you climb these mountains and you grow in your understanding. I, of course, initially approached it with a Westerner's view to speed, fast, record, set a record. I was going to be the first woman under 40, uh, first woman over 45 to climb all 100 in a year. Da, da, da. 
And it occurred to me slowly over the course of the year, and I talk about this in Climb, that there was a reason that Japanese people don't do this as a record. You miss, you know, people talk about not seeing the forest for the trees. Well, you don't see the mountain, you don't see the Yakumezan for the speed at which you have to climb them. And I won't give away everything because the book talks about how I came to this realization, the things that happened, the way that it altered my journey. But I am still in the process of climbing the Yakumezan. I tell people, I, you know, spoiler alert, I did in fact manage to climb 100 mountains. I'm still climbing the Yakumezan. What does that mean? How does that work? You better have to read the book. But Japan's mountains are absolutely spectacular. And the mountains all do have very different characteristics. Some of them are live volcanoes. Some of them are no longer. I would call them dormant. They're not dead because they are, not, they are still very much alive. But some are dormant. Some are not volcanoes. And there are all different kinds of great things, history, culture, food, animals. Uh, you see it all when you climb these peaks. I could not agree more. And one of the things that, you know, it does change your your way of thinking. And it's one of those things when I visit, there are just those little things that occur to where it's like a society based things. And I come back often and I'm like, why is it this more like this, you know, elsewhere? And uh, you find yourself... Um, slowing down a bit and taking things as they are and not needing to rush uh, to the grocery store for no reason. <laughs> Just, you know, it, it really does change kind of that focus. And one of the quotes that hit me the most when reading Climb was basically when you had said, you know, I did not want to die. I felt as if I hadn't even lived. And more accurately, I felt as if I hadn't lived enough. And your hope that this year would leave you as a more confident and stronger version of yourself. You know, I can I can remember uh, thinking that, and more than once. You know, and you get a cancer diagnosis, and you think to yourself, "Wow, I mean, cancer this this could kill me. Yes, I could die." And I thought back on my life and what it had been, and I had already started having the idea that I wanted to break free from my fears, but. Adding the cancer diagnosis on top of that really add a added a layer to it that made me feel like, wait a minute, what if this is all, what if what I've had is all I get? That it just, I didn't use it right. I didn't use it the way I wanted to use it. I, I, and I had done a lot of things. I had been to law school. I had published novels. I had a son of whom I was and still am very proud. And yet, I was looking back on it and thinking the things that really matter are not the money you have in the bank or the number of hours you work. You know, there's that old saying that nobody on their deathbed wishes they had worked more. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, you know, if I have more time, I want to do it differently. And I can tell you now, five years down the line, in fact, I go in this week to get my five-year post-cancer testing done. And assuming that the tests come back clear, we will finally be able to call it a cure and I will finally ring the bell that I refused to ring at the end of my treatment because I said, I'll ring it at five years once I'm truly a survivor. But I can tell you now, looking back on the five years that I've had since, I have lived them the way I wanted to live. And that, that has made a huge difference. I can appreciate that. Uh, so many, you know, so much on so many levels and, um, kind of a change of pace from things this year. One thing that caught me as humorous, um, and those of you that have been to Japan and attempted to see Mount Fuji, uh, understand me, <laughs> you know, how you had basically 30 previous attempts to see this mountain. And, you know, like, you know, once you see it, it's funny how that all of those times it was hiding on you, um, it begins to appear uh, that much easier. I don't know <laughs> what it is about that, uh, but that 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 did um, you know make me laugh with with your struggles, uh, you know, to go see. Many years and many attempts, and I did not was not able to see Fuji, and I started wondering to myself, what on earth do I have to do to let this mount get this mountain on my side and let her let me see her? And uh, again, talk about it in the book, but. There was a very specific series of events that led up to me finally being able to see to see her. And in fact, I saw the view from atop her before I actually got to see the view from the bottom. So there you go. 
Uh, that's, uh, it's, it's great. It's great. And one of the things I love about being in Japan and exploring um, on my own or with others is stumbling across things that you were completely unaware of uh, and un unaware of the fact that they were even going on and coming out of a train station at, at, for a Marioka uh, station and coming across the festival. Um, it's definitely one of those shining examples. So could you tell me uh, a little bit about that time? Yes. So again, I set off never having climbed a mountain in my life to climb 100 mountains in a year, which of course was incredibly foolish in retrospect. And my climbing schedule was very aggressive. And it didn't even occur to me that, you know, this might be a problem. So my first trip out, of, my second trip out of Tokyo, my overnight trip, I was going to climb five mountains in Aomori in five days. And I did the first two back to back and realized this was a really terrible idea. I'm sore. And so I decided to take a rest day instead of one of the mountains. And I was already heading to Morioka. I had a hotel room that, there that night because I was supposed to go there, climb a mountain. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do a rest day. But of course, all I was doing was climbing mountains. So I hadn't done any research on Morioka. This was my first trip up into Tohoku, into the northern region. And I had no idea what it was about. And I thought, well, I mean, it's a city. I'll go figure out something. I'll get off the train. I'll check into the hotel. I'll find something to do. I have no idea. So I come up out of the train station and am immediately, I mean, there are cones everywhere. I, I mean, it looks like the giant orange traffic cone migration of 2000s. I mean, it was like every traffic cone within a 500 mile radius is in the street. I'm just going, something's going on. They've got it all of them. Something's going on here. I thought it was just construction. I just thought, well, you know, there's all these cones. It's just way overdoing the cones. And a woman comes up to me and she's got a clipboard and she says, you know, what brings you to the Kizuna Festival today? And I went, wanted to see the festival. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because obviously the answer, what Kazuna Festival probably wasn't going to be the best option, right? So I went ahead and uh, and she handed me a brochure and I talk about this in the book. And I was like, well, fine, I'm, I guess we're having a festival out of nowhere. You know, I happen to have a rest. You talk about serendipity. I happen to have a rest day. I happen to go to Morioka. I happened to walk face first into the largest festival in the entire Tohoku region, which is a festival to celebrate the festivals that take place in the various prefectures of the Tohoku region. And so there was this giant parade and there were places with, you know, horses and people and dancers and floats. And basically it was all of the culture of Tohoku put into a overstuffed package. And it was one of the best days and it was totally unplanned. And this is something that I tell everyone when they come to travel everywhere, but particularly in Japan, which is make your plans, but leave flexibility because Japan has a way of having really cool, amazing things just sort of pop up on you. And if you've built enough flexibility into your plans to take advantage of them, you can alter course and really have an amazing experience that maybe you couldn't have planned even if you had tried. And that was what the Morioka, that was what the, the Kizuna Festival was for me. No, oh, and it was, it's, it, it is. And that's a great way to go about looking about things, uh, you know, in general. And, and as one, uh, I think a lot of people listening will be able to relate to uh, either uh, previously or when they go ahead. So I love it. I love it. And at the festival, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you talk about your love of, uh, Dongo. And, uh, you know, I, I am right there with you is one of my favorite things. Whenever I see a uh, fest, uh, festival, it's one of my things that I try to search out and get and whatever I can, a uh, little bit of me, it's just like a blanket, you know, an adult blanket that I can put on. And it's just one of my favorite things in the world. Yes. Dongo are, are wonderful. For people who might not know, Dongo are made of mochi, which is pounded glutinous rice flour. And people who, are, who say, oh, no, I'm allergic to gluten. No, that's wheat gluten, rice gluten. Gluten is just a protein that holds things together. So you can be allergic to wheat gluten and still eat glutinous rice. Don't worry about that. But the rice is pounded until it becomes very chewy. It has this very chewy, smooth texture. And sometimes it's flavored. In fact, I think you mentioned both you and I really love the uh, kurogoma or black sesame dango. 100%. <laughs> and sometimes, you, so basically it's this chewy rice balls that they put on a stick. Sometimes they grill them 
If you come to Japan, one great place to find these if you want to try them, Mount Takao, which is within day trip distance of Tokyo. There's a chairlift or a trolley, so you can ride up the mountain and just hike around at the top and then hike back down. But on the paths on Mount Takao, there is a vendor that sells grilled dango, and they sell both kinako, which is roasted soybean flavor, and they are soy... It's roasted soybean powder that's sweetened. It tastes like peanut butter. Really, I think the first time I came to Japan and tried kinako, I thought it was just peanut powder, but it, it's actually made from soybeans. It tastes like peanuts, though. And she also sells these black sesame ones, and they're grilled over a charcoal fire the traditional way. They're really, really tasty. They did have wonderful ones at the Kizuna Festival. They, In fact, the vendor selling the dango was right next to a vendor who was selling shaved ice. So I had a, a Morioka apple shaved ice and dango, and it was spectacular. <laughs> also, another bid for great dango, there's a very traditional dango that is served in the Kiso Valley. And so if you go to Magome and Sumago, which are preserved villages up in Gifu, you can get great dango up there too. Outstanding, outstanding. And one of the things that I think uh, might get people to listen today is it, maybe not even knowing about uh, climb itself, is just climbing in Japan. And I would think that if they're going to pick one mountain to try to climb when they go, it might be Fuji. Uh, could you share any uh, tips or recommendations that you have uh, for listeners that might be <laughs> looking to take that on themselves? Sure. First of all, if you always wanted to climb a mountain, but you didn't actually know how to climb a mountain or you don't want to actually do the climbing part, <laughs> you can go down to Kyoto and Hiezan or Hie, Mount Hie is a sacred mountain down there. You can take a chairlift up to the top, uh, not chairlift, it's a, a cable car up to the top. And you can actually stay in a temple on top of Hiezan at Hiezan and Ryakuji, which is a wonderful place. It's a very modern sort of Ryokan environment, but it's a temple. They have temple cuisine. So if you want to try temple cuisine, but you aren't going to be able to get down to Koyasan, which is, of course, my, my favorite mountain to go to in Japan repeatedly, I think uh, Hiezan in Ryakuji is a great place. You can book it online. You can book it with a goda. So it's very easy. You can do it in English, very English friendly. If you are interested in the sacred mountains down there, Koyasan in Wakayama is top of the list. I recommend Ekoin, which is a temple that you can stay in down there. There are, but many of the temples I've stayed in about nine of them, and they're all wonderful. If you want to climb Mount Fuji, I recommend you do it as an overnight, and that you book a place. Again, you can book it online in one of the lodges, because the best way to do Fuji, in my opinion, is you climb halfway up, and or more than halfway up. You spend the night. You get up at midnight and you climb from 11 or 12 at night until you reach the summit, may reach the summit in time for dawn and you can watch dawn rise over Japan, which is really, really special. It's on my list still. So I, I you know, definitely want to make that at some point in time, uh, sooner rather than later, for sure. And one of the things that you talk about in your book is uh, climbing with guides and climbing by yourself. Um, is there anything you'd like to share uh, just with your experiences on both? Sure. I climb with guides very seldom. I only typically climb with guides when I'm climbing mountains that are either particularly dangerous or mountains that I cannot get to on my own, which for me to date has only meant in Hokkaido. Okay. Uh, elsewhere, I do, I do normally climb solo or I sometimes I'll hike with friends if they come to hike with me, but I typically self-guide. I think it depends on your experience level. I think if you're not very experienced, climbing with a guide can be a really great idea. It can save you a lot of uh, fear. It can save you some uh, troubles. I did get lost more than once. You know, I, I had to learn. Uh, I went through this one year crash course of 100 mountains, and I probably made most of the mistakes you can make that are non fatal, but came out of it fine and now really love. I love hiking alone because I like the solitude. However, I already mentioned Ido Gabe and Hokkaido Nature Tours once. I will mention them again because they bear repeating. They are wonderful guides. Their job is not only the way they see it, is not only to lead you, but if you can't carry a heavy pack, some of them will carry the gear for you so that you don't have to carry 
they're also really amazing in that if you want to learn more, like they gave me some great hiking technique tips, especially for descent. They saw that I was struggling a little bit with descending, that I was very frightened, that my technique was not great. And they were like, hey, do you want some technique tips? I was like, yes, teach me how to come down. And they gave me some technique tips about using my legs as springs and how to balance my weight. And so they, they not only guided me, they not only knew the route, they not only drove me to the mountain and back from the mountain, but they actually improved my technique as well, which is great. I mean, it's fantastic. So I really, I really advocate climbing with guides when there are, you know, when it works with your style, when it works with what you want to do. And maybe it works with your style, even if you think you're not the kind of person who likes to hike with a guide, because I now would never hike Hokkaido any other way. I mean, I really love going with them and they're really great friends. They've become friends who I've stayed in touch with and they're friends of mine as well as, you know, having been my guides. So yeah, really recommend them. Love it. And can you tell us a little bit more about the Kumano uh, Koto pilgrimage? Yes. Uh, Kumano Koto, which I hiked in 2018. I hiked it again in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic because we all thought it was ending, only it wasn't. And then I'm actually about to leave in two weeks to go climb it, uh, to go hike it again with friends that I was supposed to hike it with in 2020. In fact, Laura Van Arendonk Ba, who introduced you to me, who introduced you to me, is one of the people I'm hiking with. And so the Kumano Kodo is a sacred pilgrim trail that runs across the key peninsula through the mountains of Wakayama. And that is about two hours south of Kyoto by train. So to give you some sort of perspective, Wakayama is the key peninsula sits off the southern coast of Honshu. And so it's south of Osaka, south of Kyoto. The pilgrimage started over a thousand years ago, basically around the 800s, I think, are the first records. And pilgrims would travel across the mountains along a variety of trails to visit the three Kumano Grand Shrines, which are Kumano Hongu Jin Taisha, Kumano Nachi Taisha, and Kumano Hayatama Taisha. And the three grand shrines are dedicated to the Kumano deities, who are three deities. They represent life, death, and rebirth. They represent the past, the present, and the future. And the idea of the pilgrimage is that as you move through the mountains, you yourself experience a spiritual life, death, and rebirth. And so it's a really great way to visit your past, your present, and your future, to think about those things, to meditate on them. It is a Shinto pilgrimage, although it has a lot of Buddhist aspects because of the syncretic nature of Shinto and Buddhism in Japan, which basically just means that they blended with one another as they came into Japan over time. Shinto is the native Japanese religion, and Buddhism, of course, was an import from China. The Kumano Kodo Nakahechi, which is the route that I have hiked so far, is one of two registered UNESCO World Heritage pilgrimages on the planet, the other one being the Camino Santiago or the Way of St. James in Spain. And I absolutely adore the Kumano. It is a peaceful, powerful, life-changing sort of a hike. I'm going to give another hat tip here to people who are thinking about hiking it. There are various ways that you can go, that you can organize it. My personal preference, I actually book my travel through Walk Japan, which offers, as a company, you can Google Walk Japan, you will find them. They offer a Kumano Wayfarer, which is a self-guided tour. So they make all the arrangements, they book all the lodgings, they transport your suitcase every day. So all you have to do is hike with a day pack. And it's very reasonably priced. In fact, I've priced it doing it myself because I've now done it three times. And it's actually less expensive to go through Walk Japan than to book the same accommodations yourself. So I really recommend that. And for people who might not be comfortable, even though they couldn't make it easier, they give you a root booklet, they give you 100 pages worth of history that you can read or not read. But if you like, you might as well. I, mean, I loved it. it was wonderful, great history about the area. Can't recommend Walk Japan highly enough. They offer, as I said, both the Wayfarer, which is self-guided, which is what I do, and then they also do a guided version. So if you want to do it as a guided tour and you want to have a guide there to walk with you, make sure that you don't get lost, make sure that you have somebody telling you the history so you don't have to read about it, you can do the Walk Japan 
guided tour of the Kumano Kodo, I recommend that also. It takes about a week. And again, I couldn't recommend it more. Love it. And just one last uh, question that wasn't a part of the list of there. Is there any equipment or things that you would have as like a necessity? If you were going to be climbing or hiking uh, in Japan, what are your go-to things that you would say are like, I, I can't go without? I mean, hiking boots, right? You, you really do need hiking boots. Most of the mountains in Japan are more what I would call trekking than technical climbing. You're not going to be doing, you know, ice, you don't need ice picks and crampons, although I do have crampons for winter hiking because you do get snow and ice in the mountains. Um, I have really good hiking boots. I have both winter hiking boots and summer hiking boots, but any hiking boots will do. Lightweight hiking boots are usually sufficient if your feet don't get cold. I hike with a pair of carbon fiber hiking poles, collapsible poles, just because I find that they really extend my ability to hike for long periods of time. I really like them. I know a lot of people say, oh, I don't hike with poles. And I never used to, but I, I really, really love them. And of course, a good day pack. Uh, I like camelbacks because I like having the water bladder so I don't have to stop to get a drink. I find that I hydrate better if I have just a drinking tube. But again, your mileage may vary. But I would say those three things, hiking boots, hiking poles, and a hat. Oh, and a hat. Y'all got to have a good hat because you don't want to get sunburned. Could not agree more. And I, I could talk to you all day um, about Climb Itself, but I really want uh, for the listeners of the show to check it out on an, on their own and find and enjoy everything that is there um, and reach out to both of us and let us know uh, definitely what you think about it. But as we kind of transition back uh, towards Japan and yourself and things that you have, could you tell me a little bit more about uh, books that you have and are working on to, uh, you know, accompany our talk? Yeah, I am currently finishing up a new modern thriller set in Japan, which my agent is really excited about. I'm hoping to be able to have more that I can say about that. The basically way that I describe it is uh, Indiana Jones meets Tomb Raider in modern Japan. It's a very action-packed sort of a thriller so hopefully there'll be more more news about that in 2023 and i am also working actually on a book about the kumano kodo called as the crow flies that i hope will be a 2023 release about hiking the kumano kodo through the great pandemic of 2020 and then also i am of course working on the next hero and father mateo novel because i'm always working on the next one of those so three books, three irons in the fire, and many, many more ideas as well. Love it. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you feel that you're facing as a writer right now, and how are you tackling them? Wow, boy, that is a loaded question. I found it very difficult to write during the pandemic. I think most writers that I know did. It was very hard to put words on the page, and I... Curiously, I'm an avid reader. I normally read at least two books a week. I had a hard time even reading during the pandemic. It was very, very difficult for all of us. I found myself rereading old books that I had enjoyed previously. And I came to discover that psychologists found this perfectly understandable. Apparently, the old familiar was what we were all looking for because it provided comfort during this time when everything was so uncertain. The wonderful news is that I'm working again, and I'm working again very effectively, and that makes me feel so happy. The biggest challenge that I'm facing as a writer right now, though, is that after climbing all the mountains and climb, I really changed my life. I changed my lifestyle. I'm much more active than I used to be. I'm out in the mountains. I like to go watch the seasons change. I'm exploring things. I just bought a house that's near a massive park, and it's a wonderful place to go and walk even when I'm not hiking. And so I think the biggest challenge is keeping my rear end in the chair because I have so many other active things that I enjoy doing. But I'm handling it by just the same discipline that I instilled when I was first starting to write, which is requiring myself to spend one hour a day, minimum. And... Once my behind's been in the chair for an hour, if I taper off or I'm not doing well, I'm allowed to get up. But more often than not, once you get the pump primed, the words start flowing and it lasts longer than an hour. Outstanding. 
And one thing I'd like to just ask is if you'd like to share any favorite books, uh, YouTube, podcast, uh, it could be on Japan or other things itself that you uh, might think that someone might be interested in. Actually, yes. A friend of mine, and I'm going to make fair disclosure that she is my friend, but we became friends after I knew about her stuff. So I'm going to count it, right? Uh, Japanogram by Janelle Patrick. Janelle Patrick, J-O-N-E-L-L-E. Patrick, like St. Patrick, P-A-T-R-I-C-K. If you Google her name, you will find her website. She has written The Tokyo Guide I Wish I'd Had, which is actually the title of the guide. And so she has fabulous ideas. And this is something that I will mention to people. Uh, You know, I've been living in Japan for five years. I have been to Japan for over a decade. I've got a lot of experience traveling here. Janelle still has things that she's done that I haven't done. There's so much to do in Japan that no matter how experienced you are, my recommendation is that you just get in there and dig in podcasts like this one. Wonderful ways to get new ideas. So Janelle Patrick, she has a newsletter. She has a blog. She has that great guide. Love her stuff. If it comes to fiction, I'm going to throw you back at Laura Van Arendonkba, whose Kitsune Tales are wonderful, wonderful fantasy based in Japan. And so she's got, and all, of course, all of her writing is is fabulous. So anything that she's written is, of course, delightful. And she has a novel that's coming out uh, soon as well. I, you know, I was on the, the mailer back from our talk. So I'm excited for her and for you and just everything uh, that you, you know, all of you have, you know, kind of coming out uh, with your books and things like that as well. That's it's wonderful. Thank you. And I know that our 2022 is almost over, especially by the time our episode comes out uh, together. Um, But what are your goals beyond uh, 2022 uh, for for next year or the years to up and coming? I am starting a very long hike of a long trail called the Kanto Furiano Michi, which is the Kanto Friendship Trail. It is a, well, it's over 200 kilometers in length, and it completely encircles the Kanto Plain, which is Japan's largest agricultural plain, which is the area where Tokyo sits, goes through five prefectures. I estimate it's going to take me about two years to hike it because I'm going to be hiking it just sort of on weekends and when the weather permits. And so my plan is to hike the Kanto and write a book about that. I am going to finish this thriller and, again, to keep my promise to myself to watch the seasons change in the mountains. And I'm also just going to be spending time with writer friends. Laura Van Arendonk Baugh, Janelle Patrick is back in the country. And also I have another friend who lives here whose name is Claire Humans. And actually Claire writes a wonderful series, by the way, that is suitable for everyone from kids to adults. So if you have young people who like Japan and are interested in Japan, you might not want to turn them loose with something like gruesome murders. You might want to try Claire's books. Her series is called The Toki Girl and the Sparrow Boy, and they are wonderful uh, historical fantasy set in sort of an Edo period type Japan. Wonderful books. I highly recommend them. So I'm going to be spending time with those friends and writing and watching the seasons change. Well, if you don't mind, uh, definitely share the information and I'll include that in the uh, sh- show notes as well. Cause why not? Why not? Uh, Wonderful. <laughs> and I know we've gotten to our point. We've been together for about an hour, uh, which is a perfect time, I think, to, you know, begin to kind of learn, learn about each other and all that you have to offer. and Definitely, we'll look to have you on again in the uh, future. But is there anything that you'd want to share with the listeners of the show that we haven't discussed to this point? The biggest thing I think I would say to people is that Japan sometimes seems very scary to people who haven't been here. They say, oh, I can't speak the language. and I'm afraid that I wouldn't be able to get around. And my encouragement is come to Japan. Come to see this beautiful country You don't need Japanese to get around in the big cities. If you're in Tokyo, if you're in Kyoto, if you're in Osaka, things are written in English, signs are in English, there are menus that are in pictures, you can point, you can get around. And a lot of people here do speak English. Japanese people and expats are always willing to help. So I would just say, you know, give it a shot. Come on out, find a guide if you're not comfortable going by yourself, but don't let fear 
stop you from coming to Japan or from doing anything else that you want to do in your life. Life is too short and fear is a liar. It tells you things that just are not true. 100%. And once more, uh, where could listeners of Lost Without Japan find and support you? My website is susanspan.com. Susan, S-U-S-A-N-S-P, like Peter, A-N-N.com. I am on Facebook, Susan Span Books. I am on Instagram, Susan Span Author. And I am on Twitter, although I'm not as active as I used to be. So if you want to find me, come to my blog, come to Facebook, come to Instagram. You'll find me regularly. The books can be found anywhere books are sold. Amazon, local bookstores, shout out to the local bookstores. Please support them. Libraries, also wonderful, got me started with my love of books. All of those places are wonderful. Wonderful. And thank you again so much, Susan, for setting aside time uh, to join myself and our listeners today. I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It's been great to talk with you. So on behalf of Lost Without Japan and the entire crew, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this interview. And we truly look forward to seeing you on board again for our next regularly scheduled episode as we continue our discussion on Japan, travel, culture, and your loss without moments. To everyone out there, oginki day. Stay well, my friends. <laughs>